Um, this has been a very enlightening week. Especially, I especially like the first presentation you did on the human actions, uh, mostly the world, yeah. according to Peter Berke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like the fact that you emphasize the return from neoclassical and rational analysis, uh, rational analysis of choice, to a more broad um, interpretation of economic science which is one that includes uh, different kinds of knowledge, local knowledge, uh, institutions, rules, the kind of things that are um, forming the social environment in the end. So you've called this a uh, robust political economy in previous works you've made. What does this term uh, mean and what does it entail in yeah. the long term? Well, th the simple meaning of the term robust is imagine that you had a building that had to sustain itself against earthquakes or uh, you know some kind of other high winds, natural disaster or whatever, and uh, it was it was built strong enough to be able to withstand you know those pressures. That would be a robust building, all right. And so what we want to do is we want to build a robust political economy that's able to take on the harshest criticisms, the harshest, uh, you know, critiques of our of our system and be able to still stand there. And so if you think about a political economy which is fragile, the opposite of robust, mm -hmm. that means that, you know, you just tweak a little assumption and the whole edifice comes uh, tumbling down, that would be a very fragile intellectual system as opposed to a robust system. So with regard to classical liberalism, you know, what argu the argument that has evolved around this notion of robust political economy is to, one, uh, not assume, uh, you know, perfection in man, but instead deal with men as they really are, which are sometimes, you know, uh, smart, sometimes stupid, you know, whatever, yeah. and deal with men as they are in terms of their motivations, you know, sometimes saintly, most often very, you know, base in their, uh, you know, in, uh, motivations. And if you can develop a model in which you know, the uh, institutional environment disciplines against bad men doing, you know, what you want to do is have the system be such that bad men can do least harm, rather than that good men can govern if they had all the power. And so um, classical liberalism itself is a search for a robust political economy. The idea of having <coughs> institutional systems such that if bad men get in power, they can do least harm. You've uh, explained uh, with a supply and demand diagram which you call the sexiest in the world, mm -hmm. uh, the different kinds of areas of inquiry which this mixes. What are those? And uh, with that in mind, how important is the methodological issues of Austrian economics? Is it that important as a defining aspect of it, or is it just one more? One more? Well, it's, it's, it's the essential defining characteristic and also not as important, right? And so it's kind of weird in the, in the, in the sense here. In the, in the following sense is that methodology is extremely important because it defines not only what you consider to be good questions, but even more importantly, what you consider to be good answers to those questions. And so you have to fight the methodological battle. So George Stigler, the great economist, used to tell his students that you should only do methodology when you're really old. Mm -hmm. And that is after you've had a career and you reflect back. Before that, you should just do what your teachers tell you and pursue your path, at, you know, the way you do economics. My own view has been that, that you know, uh, uh, Stigler missed it by one, because you should do methodology at least twice in your life. When you're young and you're deciding how it is that you want to approach your craft, and then when you're old, when you reflect backwards and think about how successful or failure your efforts have been, right? But what I, you know, one of the problems with a lot of uh, young people is that they never get beyond methodology to the actual doing of economics. And I think you should get on with the doing of economics. Now, because I'm focused on the doing of economics and the conversation that you have with other economists in doing that, I both, both my work both emphasizes methodology and then de-emphasizes it mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, which is that I think it's important to get the basic groundwork set about what's a good question and what's a good answer, but I also think our goal is to engage in dialogue with other people in the economics profession about the insights that Mises and Hayek have to bear on the questions that we can agree on as economists are important questions. And so in that regard, I wouldn't let methodology be the thing that stops me from conversing with my colleagues. 
Um, in fact, I think the strength, greatest strength of, of methodology is to show people that your work is valuable in and of itself. And then when they ask you, how did you go about doing it? Then you can tell them, well, because I pursued the Austrian methodology, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of times people view methodology as a conversation starter, st excuse me, conversation stopper. And what I want to do is I want to see it as a conversation starter. You know, that is getting us into answering these questions. I think it's more important for us to understand what's going on out in the world than it is to be faithful to, to a tradition. That's right. Well, in the mixing of uh, those different spheres, one of them is the political. And this is where Chris's works come in, because uh, political issues have mostly been discussed outside of the realm of economics as if, it's what, as if it was independent of it. And the uh, political economy of exporting democracy is one of the examples in which that has happened. Um, when you begin to understand humans as practically fallible and imperfect, with imperfect knowledge and that thing, what is the importance of getting that economic way of thinking into the realm of politics, according to you? Sure. Well, there is, I mean, there has been this intersection of politics and economics, public choice economics, mm -hmm. which started in the late 50s, early 60s, or at least came to the forefront, yeah. um, or began to come to the forefront at that point in time. But what I've tried to do in my own work is, is kind of apply the logic um, from the Austrian economics, um, the work of Hayek on the, no on the limits of, the no of human knowledge, and then kind of pulling in these public choice views, so the incentives created by political institutions, mm -hmm. to, uh, to attempt to analyze the ability of experts to uh, kind of design the very institutions Pete was talking about. In other words, to design robust political economy institutions abroad. So Pete's work in robust political economy t tries to, in a way, define what, what the ideal is or what kind of institutions we should try to, to design. Mm -hmm. You could view my work as an extension of that or an application mm -hmm. in a way to then understand, well, what's our actual ability of outsiders? Uh, and by outsiders, I don't necessarily even mean those outside the society. I mean those who are um, have distance with the relevant knowledge that we're talking, that's relevant for designing these institutions. Mm -hmm. What can they actually do? So what I've tried to do in my work is point out the limits of, of our knowledge in designing robust um, political and economic institutions abroad. But then on top of that, trying to understand what actually happens when we try to do it. So number one, we lack the knowledge to do it, even in an ideal setting. But then when you actually try to do it, not only do you lack the knowledge, but then you open kind of this bag of incentives that leads to very, very perverse outcome. So you have all these different layers of rent seeking and interest groups who try to influence policy. You have massive waste due to bureaucracy you have unintended consequences. And ultimately what, hap what ends up happening is not only do you fail to accomplish um, the design of effective, robust political and economic institutions, but in many cases you can cause more harm than good. Okay. Another extension, as you called it, of that work uh, is your upcoming work on international aid, which is a theme that's more relevant to us in Latin America because nobody's trying to export democracy to us anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Is is the same case applied? How is it different in the circumstances? Sure, well, it, it's the same logic. So it's the same mm -hmm. logic, but it's, it's just a, a variant of the application. So currently what I'm focused on is humanitarian aid. And what, the way I view that is in the broadest sense, anything from short-term kind of emergency assistance in the wake of natural disasters, yeah. uh, ranging all the way to long-term development aid. And they all fall under the broader notion of humanitarian because they're intended to help people who are suffering, just kind of what your time frame is. And the same exact logic applies because in order for aid to be successful under any uh, scenario or in any context, you have to, number one, possess the relevant knowledge. In other words, how should those resources be allocated in a manner which minimizes suffering? And then the second issue is one of ensuring that the appropriate incentives exist such that when you do allocate the aid uh, in, in whatever manner it is that you want to, that people actually utilize it as you wish them to do so. Uh, and one of the things I'm going to be pointing out is in many cases, we lack the relevant knowledge and the, the relevant incentives. So it's kind of the, the worst of both worlds. Um, outsiders lack the knowledge of how to allocate resources on paper. In other words, in, uh, how do I plan the allocation of aid just like you would essentially plan an economy, we lack that knowledge. And then on top of it, you have these perverse incentives which leads to subsequent distortions. And again, very similar point I was making before, in many cases, you, you actually create more harms than would have existed if you hadn't uh, intervened in the first place. This new research program, I would call it a research program, um, is an empirical, needs to be provided with empirical evidence. 
and uh, I have got a knowledge only about the kind of thing like the Ostroms did the research with the uh, common property and that kind of thing. Is there another case in point with uh, either what you've studied or what you've done that in which the understanding of this different sets of institutions and different kinds of knowledge has been applied consistently and it has worked? Do you, can you think of someone? Well, can I take a stab and then you? Because yeah. <coughs> uh, Chris, Chris sets up um, in his work a very uh, sort of um, very cl um, clear empirical application of his ideas mm -hmm. um, that then can be used as a benchmark and so he does I'll let him talk about that but um, in my earlier work which you know uh, we haven't really talked about here um, that was in uh, the reforming economies the economic history of the the history and practice and collapse of communism mm -hmm. and so uh, you know I did three books on that and um, the last book is a set of studies on the transition years um, so basically, if you think about, you know, what I, I did was I, you know, I studied a lot about the formation of the Soviet system and using the theory of Mises and Hayek and Buchanan and Tulloch in the politics sense. So Mises and Hayek on the economy and Buchanan and Tulloch on the, you know, on the political side as a lens, as a theoretical lens to frame the debate about the origin and practice of socialism in Russia after the revolution. So the Soviet, the forming of the Soviet Union, that was my first book. And there was a, there's a debate among historians over, you know, what was going on during that period of time. And I use economics as an adjudicator between the competing stories of the historians to try to say which is the one that's the more compelling narrative. And then the same thing with the collapse of communism uh, in the 19, late 1980s. Um, you know, that's my second book, which is called Why Perestroika Failed, and it's examination using the market process theory of Mises and Hayek and Kirzner and the political science of Buchanan and Tulloch and Mansur Olson and some others mm -hmm. to examine the um, fracturing of the system and why the system collapsed under its own weights. And then from that, how do you, you know, transition? So that kind of work is empirical, it's, it's theory framed, mm -hmm. and it's empirical in what now has later been called, wasn't at the time that I first started writing this, what's been called an analytic narrative approach. Mm -hmm. And this has been an approach that a lot of rational choice political scientists and new economic historians associated with Douglas North and, and others have now dubbed their work, which is different from what they called Cleometrics. So Cleometrics was the attempt to use econometrics techniques on older reconstructed data sets. So you would look at data from, let's say, the 19th century in Guatemala, right, on, you know, development and growth. You would reconstruct that data because we don't have that good of data. So we would use economic theory to help reconstruct the data. And then what we would use is modern statistical techniques to test, you know, theories against that data, right? That's Cleometrics. What the analytical narrative approach is, is to do the kind of narrative history, especially in situations where the data is highly questionable or we're not sure that we can reconstruct the data, but yet use economic way of thinking to frame that discourse and to adjudicate between competing theories about what's going on. Because the, the, the battle lines are being drawn by the theoretical perspective. Yeah. You know, a Marxist analytical narrative will look different than an Austrian analytical narrative, right? And, and so the question is, how do you then frame that, that debate? You debate that on the theoretical grounds, mm -hmm. all right? And then you use this as Ill illustrative you know, cases, all right? And so that's, it's, it's a broadly very much an empirical pr program. You're trying to uh, apply the teachings of the, of good, e what I'll call good economics mm -hmm. right now, and, uh, and, and, and structure, um, you know, economic, uh, historically accurate narratives about what the, the sort of human condition as it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. and, and Austrian economics helps frame that discussion. So it's not just blackboard Austrian economics, it's not just philosophy of the Austrian school, mm -hmm. this is the, the application of the Austrian approach to understanding actual real world historical events and that, that it's consistent with an approach now called analytic narratives. 
yeah, Chris can tell you because Chris goes a little further in his work and gives a, a kind of a very good you know benchmarking position. So I'll let you. So what I did in, in my book after war to kind of lay out the puzzle that I was trying to address or to take an initial empirical stab at, at understanding um, what was going on. So let me just step back for a moment. In, in that book, what I was trying to do is is look at U.S. attempts to export democracy following conflict. So to, to kind of get an initial snapshot of that, what I did was I looked at all the cases of. U.S. military occupation since um, 1898, that's Cuba, um, which many consider to be kind of the first U.S. major occupation up to the present, or at least Iraq and Afghanistan, when I say present. And um, what I did was use the Polity Index, which is a measure of institutionalized democracy and autocracy. So it ranges from negative 10 to positive 10. Negative 10 is fully institutionalized autocracy. Uh, positive 10 is something like the United States, it's fully institutionalized democracy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I did was compare the performance before and after, and then after the U.S. Um, military occupiers left, 5, 10, 15, and 20 years after. Then, of course, you have to pit, pit, uh, pick a benchmark. And there's debate among political scientists about what a mature or consolidated uh, democracy, how that's ranked. A lot of um, political scientists say a plus seven. So what I did was to, in order to give the U.S. the benefit of the doubt, I looked at plus four, which is the equivalent of present-day Iran. So basically the way the question is framed is, was the United States able to establish the equivalent of present-day Iran and ha have it sustained 5, 10, 15, and 20 years after U.S. occupiers left? And the performance is actually quite poor. It's something like, best case, um, when you drop out you know, all the 90s, that's like 20 years out, you get something like in the 30s in terms of success rate, and when you add those back in, you're in the low 20s. Uh, and of course, Japan and Germany, uh, post-World War II Japan and Germany are two of the big main drivers here. So that was kind of my initial stab at that, and then what I did is, is look at specific cases. I looked at Haiti and Somalia, mm -hmm. I looked at uh, post-World War II Japan and Germany, and then um, Afghanistan and Iraq, which are still ongoing. But what I, um, what I tried to do then is use the tools of economics to kind of resolve this puzzle, uh, or attempt to resolve the puzzle of why we have some cases of success and others of failure. In the case of humanitarianism, um, again, there are some interesting ways to look at the puzzle. Um, one recent one in terms of natural disasters is Japan versus Haiti versus Chile. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, Japan's earthquake was much worse than Haiti's, um, and a lot fewer people died. And Japan uh, basically doesn't or needs very little, if, if any, external aid to rebuild. And they're, they're rebuilding very quickly. Um, with, they're going to be basically back to where they started uh, in a matter of years, where Haiti's just a disaster. Um, despite a lot more aid flowing in and a lot more aid workers and experts. So the, the interesting puzzle here is why in one case you have uh, a weaker strength natural disaster in terms of uh, magnitude on the Richter scale, is what I, when I say strength of the natural disaster, uh, yet you have a lot more deaths and a lot slower recovery in Haiti versus in Japan where it's a lot stronger. And we can utilize, as Pete was saying, the tools of political economy to resolve this puzzle, uh, where, where the typical response of experts is, is okay, the effort in Haiti is failing, we need even more resources, more experts, better planning. Mm -hmm. The tools of political economy indicate that, that that's, it's exactly the opposite of that, that it's the planning and, and just pouring resources in which is causing the fundamental problem in the first place. One of the things, like the try harder mm -hmm. hypothesis, you know, one of the things that's, that's uh, fascinating in all of this uh, discussion is, you know, we don't impose our ends. Yeah. So the approach that Chris and I follow is not to say, okay, your goal is to establish a classical liberal system mm -hmm. and you're failing at a classical liberal system. We're literally taking the ends as given. So whatever the policy makers say they're going to try to do, we take it as given and then st limit our analysis strictly to the means and ends. Um, some people get confused about this because it seems like, oh, you guys are advocating. No, we're not advocating anything. It's analysis. It's a praxeological mm -hmm. analysis. You treat ends as given. You limit your analysis to the effectiveness of the chosen means to the given end that they're pursuing. And if you're showing that from their own benchmark, they're failing, right, then yeah. they should rethink their policies, right? And part of the issue that comes up, why public choice becomes so important, is because a lot of these things you can demonstrate repeated failures to achieve the stated ends and you know Einstein said the definition of insanity was you know repeating the same thing and expecting different results and so one of the things that you look at then is well you know okay so now you know what is it that the public choice incentives are for the people to do these things and you know in hope of doing that we're exposing also the sort of 
the inefficiencies, but also then the uh, sort of, um, for lack of a better word, the exploitation that's taking place and trying to concentrate the benefits on the well-organized and well-informed and disperse the costs on the unorganized and mass of, of you know, uh, citizens, that you can then somehow expose the failures of government as well as the inefficiencies of government.